Hello everyone, thank you for joining us for this Foreign National Tax Information session. This session is designed for non-resident aliens for tax purposes as well as resident aliens for tax purposes who are claiming tax treaty benefits. This session is brought to you by the University Office of the Bursar as well as the University of Chicago Shared Services Office as well as UChicago Grad. We want to start out today with a quick disclaimer. Um, the university is providing this information to students solely for informational purposes, so it is not intended to be tax or legal advice. The ultimate responsibility does lie with you, the tax filer, to ensure that your taxes are filed appropriately and on time. If you do have follow-up questions after this session, you can email gradhelp at uchicago.edu. Um, we do appreciate the people who ask questions in advance of this session. We will be addressing a few questions at the end of each section. Um, but again, if you do have additional questions at the end of the session, please do email gradhelp at uchicago.edu and someone will assist you. There are six sections to this presentation today. The first section is determining your filing requirement, who needs to file a tax return and when. The second is determining your tax residency status. Are you a non-resident for tax purposes or a resident for tax purposes? The third is reviewing your income sources. The fourth is reviewing the tax payments you may have already made and the tax forms you may have already received as well as tax forms that you may be receiving in the future. Section five is filing federal and state tax returns. And section six is additional information and where to get assistance. That includes free options as well as paid options. So step one, determining your filing requirement. You do have a filing requirement if you were present in the US as an F or J visa holder in 2018 for any length of time, including one day, or you had US source income, and you do not have a filing requirement if you had no days of physical presence in the U.S. during 2018 and you had no U.S. sourced income. We're going to unpack those a little bit in following slides, but that's a general rule. So the knowledge check for this first section here, if you arrived in the U.S. on December 31st, as an F1 student, do you have a filing requirement for 2018? The answer is yes. If you were physically present in the U.S. as an F1 non-resident for even one day in 2018, you are required to file a tax statement, and we're going to get into the details of what that tax statement may entail later in the presentation. Moving on to step two, determining your tax residency status. This status is determined by using the substantial presence test, or as we abbreviate it, the SPT. If you are, you are a resident alien for tax purposes if you have 183 days or more of countable days of physical presence in the U.S. in a given tax year. You're non-resident alien for tax purposes if you have fewer than 183 days of countable days of physical presence in the U.S. We're going to get into what constitutes a countable day in the next slide, but this is the general rule. And to get a little more specific about it, when you're counting days of physical presence in a given tax year, you do also look back to two prior tax years. So for 2018, you'll look back to 2017 and 2016, but you won't count each day of presence as a whole day. Your days of presence in 2017 would be divided by three, and your days of presence in 2016 would be divided by six. If you do have specific questions about this calculation, there's no need to worry because the software that the university does provide to help you prepare your tax return will complete this test for you. But if you have any additional questions about that, again, you can email grad help and they will get someone to answer your question. Now, exceptions to the countable days requirement. So F and J1 students receive five exempt years from counting days toward the substantial presence test. For the first five years, even if you are present in the U.S. for 365 days, your substantial presence test total will be zero because you will have no countable days. At J non-students receive two exempt years of the past six, um, meaning that if you were present in the U.S. on an F-1 visa in 2010 and then you came back as a J-1 non-student in 2018, 
your 2010 day of present or days of presence would not count because you're only looking back six years from 2018. Um, exempt years are calendar years, not years from date of arrival. So for example, if you arrived on December 31st, 2014, all of 2014 counts as an entire exempt year. Um, you know, additionally, if you arrived on January 1st, 2014, and you were present for 365 days of that year, all of 2014 would count as a year of exemption from the substantial presence test. So that's just something to be mindful of. It's five calendar years. So our knowledge check for section two, if you hold a, J, a US visa status, you must use the substantial presence test to determine tax residency. The answer is true. The substantial presence test does determine tax residency in the US for anyone holding a US visa. Another question that we got um, in advance of this presentation was, um, I am a US resident in 2019, how do I file for 2018? You always want to file as the status you were in the tax year that you're filing for. So even if you have changed to a resident for tax this year in 2019, but you were a non-resident in 2018, you will still file as a non-resident. You will still be entitled to use the tax software that the university provides for non-residents. Um, so you just wanna make sure that you are looking at the tax residency that you were for the year that you were filing for. Moving on to step three, we're going to talk about reviewing your income sources. There are three different categories of this. We're going to talk about the difference between taxable versus non-taxable income, stipend, scholarships, and fellowships, and then travel stipend or reimbursement payments. And we have a lot of questions about that last one, so we will try to get into a few examples there. First, we're going to talk about the difference between taxable and non-taxable. So you see listed on the slide some bullet points for taxable reportable income examples. Wages and salary, bonuses and awards, scholarship, fellowship income, health insurance, premiums and living expenses, and reimbursement of non-business related expenses. All of these are considered both taxable and reportable. Now here's the difference between taxable and reportable income. Taxable income is income that you have to pay tax on. It's exactly what it sounds like. Reportable income can be taxable, but it's only income that you must report to the IRS or is being reported to the IRS on your behalf. It is not necessarily income that you have to pay tax on. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Non-taxable, non-reportable income examples, so income that you both do not have to pay taxes on and do not have to report to the IRS, includes financial assistance through student loans, foreign source income, and interest income. We do have a link here. More details on income sources can be found at the IRS publication 525, which goes into taxable and non-taxable income. And we're going to do a few examples on this because it is a bit of a gray area, um, even to US persons who are trying to determine whether something is taxable or non-taxable. A lot of times it does require you to make a judgment call. So stipends, scholarships, and fellowship income. If you received funding through stipend, scholarship, or fellowship from UChicago or from a third party external source, all or part of that may be taxable even if you did not receive a tax form. If you're a candidate for a degree, you generally can exclude from this income part of the assistance that was used for tuition and fees, fees, books, supplies, and equipment related for your courses, but you may not exclude from income any part of the funding that's used for room and board, health insurance premiums, or certain reimbursements and expenses. So you're not sure how much scholarship or fellowship funding that you may have received in 2018? You can find this information by looking at the My Financial Aid section of your my.uchicago.edu account. And remember that scholarship stipend fellowship also includes funding from outside the university. So if you did a fellowship over the summer in a different state and it was funded by another institution, that income may still be taxable and reportable. It, won't, it will not be reported on any university issued tax form but you may need to contact that third party in order to get a tax form or at least some sort of memorandum um, 
telling you exactly how much money that they did give you for that portion of the year that you were working for them because it may indeed be taxable income. You can find more information and instructions on how to file um, and report that income on Tax Topic 421. Again, that's an IRS publication um, that can help you provide a few details on what that income might look like and how to report it on your tax return. Reimbursement of non-business related expenses. This is a topic that we get quite a few questions about. Um, hopefully we can provide some clarity moving forward. Reimbursements are not reportable, so you do not have to tell the, tell the IRS about them and no one else will report them to the IRS on your behalf if you can document that the reimbursement is one of the following. And then we list four examples here. We also have more examples listed on the financial services website with a few more details if you'd like to go there. Um, first, if the um, reimbursement was related to something that directly supports a faculty member's project or research program, or if it's related to presenting at a conference, not just attending a conference, but if you were traveling to a conference to present, you may be able to um, show that, for example, um, the amount of money that you spent on your plane ticket, your Uber rides, and your food while you were there are not considered reportable income. Um, if it is an integral part of your degree work, so for example, if you have to have a membership at a national scientific group as part of your degree work, you may be able to exempt a reimbursement for the fees that it takes to be part of that organization. Or if you are on official university business, for example, you're a member of a team, the team that we use here is the Model UN team, and you have to travel to a competition based on your membership on that team that income may be exempt um, from being reportable to the IRS. A quick knowledge check on section three. Um, true or false, all income is taxable. As we discussed, that is false. Um, all income should be evaluated as to whether it's taxable or non-taxable, and we provided a few links um, for you to look at that information on the IRS website directly. Now, we got some questions um, in advance of this presentation asking which parts of my financial aid package are taxable. So, as we talked about, your health insurance premiums, your scholarship, fellowship income, those are considered taxable and reportable. However, your student loans, any, or any income that may be considered loan income or that may have gone straight to a tuition remission, that would not be considered reportable income. And you can find that information on your my.uchicago.edu account. Okay, step four, reviewing tax payments that you may have already made, as well as tax forms that you may have received or may be receiving in the future. We're gonna talk about tax forms received, quarterly tax payments made, as well as tax treaties. This slide listed, lists different types of income and what tax forms that that income may be reported on. All of these tax forms that you will see in the left column, those are tax forms that would be received by you, the taxpayer. So if you had wage income, you would have received a W-2. If you had awards, prizes, or independent contractor income, you would have received a 1099. Um, if you had scholarship fellowship income or you claimed tax treaty benefits on award, prize income, wage income, or things of that nature, that would be reported on a 1042S form. And you would have received a 1098T tuition charge statement that would reflect all of the tuition charges that were made on your behalf in the current year if you had provided the bursar's office with a taxpayer ID, so a social security number or an ITIN. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. The last form is the 1095B insurance coverage statement. That is the form that signifies that you were covered by health insurance for every month of the given tax year. Um, a little tip at the bottom of the slide that we will talk about in a second. Resident aliens do not receive a tax form for stipend, scholarship, or fellowship payments. The IRS considers those to be what it calls self-reported income, meaning the taxpayer has to report it themselves, but the person who makes the payment to the taxpayer does not have to report it to the IRS or to the person who receives the payment. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. 
So we'll talk about income and quarterly estimated tax payments. Federal and state tax law requires individuals to pay estimated tax payments on self-reported income, so like we just talked about, scholarship and stipend income received by residents, or if you will owe more than $1,000 in federal taxes or $500 for Illinois state taxes, you should make estimated quarterly payments. If you don't make estimated tax payments when required to do so, technically the IRS in the state of Illinois may assess a penalty for late taxes. We'll talk about that in a second. But non-resident aliens should only have a requirement to make estimated quarterly tax payments for Illinois State since we withhold federal tax at the time of payment. As you probably know, if you've received these types of payments and you do not claim a tax treaty, you have 14% of those stipend payments are withheld for federal tax at the time of payment. How to make estimated quarterly payments. We have links to the worksheets here. Essentially, you would fill out a 1040 ES for the federal government and an IL 1040 ES for the state government. There are one-page worksheets that involve very simple arithmetic, so they should be relatively straightforward to fill out. Again, you can find the information that you would need to fill out these forms on your my.uchicago.edu account where you can access your financial aid information. Those forms will essentially estimate how much tax that you will owe for a given tax year. So if you were completing them now, you'd be completing them for 2019. They would estimate how much you would owe for 2019, divide that amount in four, and then tell you how, how, money, how much money you need to be paying on a quarterly basis to ensure that you don't owe a balance at the time that you file your 2019 tax return. These forms do include due dates and an explanation of how your estimated quarterly amounts are estimated and how to pay what is owed. But there are essentially two ways. You can either mail it in or you can make those payments online. We do link to the IRS publication 505, Tax Withholding and Estimated Tax. Um, that just provides a little more information. But again, these forms are very simple, simple arithmetic, and should be relatively easy to fill out. We also do provide information at our tax website and some frequently asked questions regarding estimated taxes. But if you have more specific questions, you can always email grad help, and someone will get back to you with a little bit of help. So a knowledge check for Section 4, you will receive a tax form for all of your taxable income. Hopefully all of you are screaming false. That is false. There are types of income that you will receive where you will not get a tax form. It's up to you to determine if the income is taxable and how to report it um, according to IRS guidelines. And we did get a few questions um, that pertain to this section in advance of this presentation, so I'll address them now. Uh, the first question is, where do I find my tax documents? Where do I find my W-2, 1042-S, things of that nature? If you have a W-2, meaning you worked for the university and received wage income that, did, that was not exempt from tax due to a tax treaty, that W-2 would be located in your Workday profile. You can access that using your CNET and password. And the W-2 would be located under Tax Documents. It's available for your download. Um, and you can also print it, but keep it for your records. 1042S forms are mailed by the university. The IRS requires us to mail those by March 15th. We typically mail them by the last week of February. So if you are listening to this presentation in March and you have not received your 1042S form already, you can reach out to us for additional information on how to get a duplicate copy. Your 1098T form, that's that tuition statement that um, tells you how much tuition that you paid to the university in a given tax year, that is issued by the Bursar's office. If you did submit a taxpayer ID, so a social security number or an ITIN, and you think that you were entitled to a 1098T form, you can contact the Bursar's office for a duplicate copy. Um, I have another question from someone pertaining to estimated tax payments. What if my funding changes mid-year? So that question, what that question is getting at is what if you complete the estimated tax worksheet in January thinking you're going to get $20,000 of funding, so $5,000 per quarter, but then you get an extra summer fellowship where you get an additional $5,000, meaning that for 2019 you'll get $25,000 in funding. We would recommend that as soon as you find out about the additional funding, complete the 1040 ES and the IL 1040 ES again. 
Um, give yourself credit for the tax payments that you've already made. So subtract out the tax payments that you're already made that you've already made, and then divide the total amount of tax that you'll owe for 2019 by the remaining number of estimated tax payments. So if originally you thought you were going to owe 2,000 for the entire tax year, but with your additional um, funding, you'll owe $2,500. You've already made $1,000 worth of payments. You'll divide $1,500 by the number of estimated quarterly payments that you have left. Another question that we got if, is, what if I haven't made any estimated tax payments? What if I needed to make estimated tax payments for 2018, but I didn't know I was supposed to? This happens very frequently. It's nothing that you need to panic about. What we recommend to students in this situation is that you pay the balance that you owe at the time that you file your 2018 tax return. Um, since all non-residents have to file um, on paper, they cannot file electronically, we recommend that when you mail in your tax return and the check for the amount that you owe, write a memo to the IRS and to the state of Illinois explaining what happened. Explain that you um, are a student studying in this country. You did not know that you needed to make estimated tax payments, but you're paying the balance in full now, and you would respectfully ask that the IRS or the Department of Revenue waive any fees that they may, or penalties or fees that they may assess. And we've had students that have had good luck um, getting penalties and fees waived using that strategy. So that is something that we recommend. Um, another question that we got, can I have my refund applied to next year's estimated tax payments? Yes, that is an option that is available to taxpayers. So what that means is if you're filing your tax return for 2018 and you're due to get a $1,500 tax refund, you can check a box on your tax return that says, I don't want the IRS to mail me a check for $1,500. I would like that money applied to tax that I may owe in 2019. And that is something that when you fill out the estimated tax worksheet, there will be a, a space on that worksheet where you can indicate that that money is being held by the IRS in escrow for your 2019 taxes. Um, another question that we got, what do I do for tax, um, tax forms for income prior to starting at the University of Chicago? We just recommend that you contact your former employer or your former university for tax forms um, prior to filing your 2018 tax return. You wanna make sure that you have every tax form that you could possibly need before you file. Um, and then uh, another question that we got, and I think we addressed this a little earlier, was how do I make estimated tax payments? Again, you can make those online or by mail. If you do make them by mail, we do recommend that you send them registered mail, meaning that you track the payment so that you can tell when the IRS received it. You won't necessarily get a receipt from them after you've mailed the check in and after they receive the check. So you just want to make sure that you have a record that you sent it and that you sent it on time. All right, now we're going to move on to section five, filing your federal and state tax returns. We're gonna talk about filing as a non-resident, filing as a resident, filing your Illinois state tax, and then filing if you had no income received in 2018, but you were present in the US for at least one day. If you are a non-resident, and I cannot stress this enough, the university provides tax software for non-residents to use. Um, it's called Sprintax Tax Software. It's available for free through the OIA website for federal tax filing using your CNET and password. Um, it will also file your state tax return, but there is a small fee associated with that. Uh, the software will do a few things for you. So first, it will determine your tax residency using the substantial presence test. If you aren't sure whether you're a non-resident or a resident, you can always log in to the Sprint Tax software, complete the substantial presence test, and if you are a resident, the software will direct you to um, stop using it and to use another resource, and we'll talk about other resources available for residents, but if you are a non-resident, you will be able to continue using the software. Um, it will also calculate any available tax treaties and any available credits, allowances, and deductions that may be available to you. This is especially important after the tax reform was passed last year um, because your tax return could look different even if your situation hasn't changed at all from 2017 to 2018. If you do not want to use the tax software that the university provides, 
You can file on your own using a 1040 NR or a 1040 NR Easy. Um, those forms are easily found online. You can Google them. Illinois state tax filing, you can file on your own using the IL 1040. If you lived and worked in another state, lived or worked in another state in 2018, you may have a tax reporting requirement in that state. So for example, if you did a fellowship in another state like Virginia um, in the summer of 2018, you may wanna go on their Department of Revenue's website just to ensure that you do not have a filing requirement. You can have a filing requirement in more than one U.S. state. So you just want to make sure before you file that you are being responsible and determining whether or not you have a filing requirement in another state. Look, some other important information for non-resident aliens who are filing tax returns. All non-residents must complete a Form 8843. Sprint Tax will complete it for you. Again, it's a relatively easy form to find online if you're filing on your own without using Sprint Tax, but you just may, must make sure that you attach it to your tax return. If you don't have a Social Security number or ITIN yet, then you must apply during the tax return process. If your spouse is also considered a non-resident alien, then you each must file your own tax return. You're not entitled to file married filing separately or married filing jointly. You each must file as single people. If your spouse is considered a resident alien per the substantial presence test, then you can elect to be treated as a resident for tax when filing a tax return. That means that if you are a non-resident and your spouse is a resident, you can both elect to be treated as residents and you can file married filing separately or married filing jointly. Any non-resident alien, including your dependents, must complete a Form 8843. So if you have children who are in the U.S. with you on F or J visas, for example, you must complete a Form 8843 on their behalf. Uh, Non-residents are not entitled to claim the standard deduction with a small exception for students from India. They are not subject to that restriction. And non-residents cannot claim most deductions that are available to resident aliens, including dependent children. Sprint Tax will help make those determinations for you if you have questions about that. Resident aliens are not able to use Sprint Tax. It's just it does not function for residents. Um, but they can use any tax preparation software such as TurboTax, IRS Free File, etc. You probably see a lot of those advertisements around. If you want to file on your own without using any tax software, you can download a Form 1040 and the appropriate schedule to make those calculations. Uh, you are entitled to file online as a resident for tax, and that is a little bit more convenient. Um, for Illinois State, you can file on your own using an IL 1040. Again, if you lived and worked, lived or worked in another state, you may also have a tax reporting requirement in that state. And a little bit more information, if you, if you or your claimed dependents, because resident aliens can claim dependents, do not have a taxpayer ID, then you must apply during the tax return process. If your spouse is considered a resident alien per the substantial presence test, um, or, I'm sorry, if your spouse is considered a non-resident alien per the substantial presence test, I believe that's a typo, then your spouse can elect to be treated as a resident for tax when filing a tax return with you, so you can file married filing separately or married filing jointly. You do not need to complete a Form 8843 if you are a resident for tax. However, if you have dependents who are not residents for tax, they, you must complete a Form 8843 on their behalf. But if you have dependents who are resident aliens, you would not need to complete an 8843 for them. You can claim the standard deduction and you can claim any applicable deductions available to U.S. persons. Um, any tax software that you use will help you calculate which deductions are available to you as a resident for tax. This slide is mostly just here as a resource for resident aliens who are claiming tax treaties. This is not a common situation, which is why the IRS forms are not necessarily um, conducive or it's not self-evident on the forms how to claim the tax treaty. This just shows you how you can claim the tax treaty most effectively on the form. But the most important thing to look at here is number three, you must complete and attach a form 8833 to include the details of the tax treaty used when you claim a treaty as a resident for tax. 
filing um, or claiming a spouse or dependent that does not have a social security number or I-10. This slide is more just a resource about the nuts and bolts of applying for a tax ID at the time you file your tax return. If you are not eligible for a social security number, so you are not working in the U.S., you're just here as a dependent and you have no income, an ITIN would be an appropriate tax ID for you. You apply for that using a W-7. Um, if you're applying for your spouse or a dependent or for yourself at the time of filing, you would complete a W-7 for each person who's applying for the number, attach the appropriate supporting documentation that is listed on the W-7, complete the federal tax return, and then mail the completed W-7 applications along with the completed tax return to the address that's on the W-7. The ITIN applications will all be processed first, and then the federal tax return will automatically be forward on, forwarded on to the IRS for processing. So because there's an extra step involved, the processing of your tax return will take about 8 to 12 weeks because it does take 4 to 6 weeks for ITINs to be assigned, and this is one of the busiest times of year for them. So you, know, you can guess that it's going to take a little bit longer um, to get that completed. For your Illinois state tax filing, you wouldn't be able to file at the time that you're applying for your ITIN, so you're going to have to hold that state tax return back until you get those ITINs list or assigned to you. So in the interim, you may need to file an Illinois state tax extension. Those extensions are free, but you do want to be sure that if you are going to owe a balance to the state of Illinois, that you go ahead and make that payment as soon as possible so you don't get a penalty for late payments. Um, dependents also must meet certain qualifications to be claimed um, on tax returns. For your Illinois state tax filing, the most important thing to look at first is do you have a filing requirement? We link to the Illinois state tax website that lists the filing requirements. Um, also, if you uh, kind of a quick cheat is if you lived or worked in Illinois and you had earned income, you probably have an Illinois filing tax requirement. Um, a part year resident taxpayer must file a form Illinois 1040 and Schedule NR. If you earned income from any source while you were a resident and you earned income from Illinois sources while you were not a resident or you want a refund of any Illinois income tax withheld. Um, you'll begin the Illinois 1040 with the adjusted gross income created on the federal tax return. So it's always a good idea to fill out your federal tax return prior to filling out your state tax return. And if you were in Illinois as a non-resident and did not have any income from Illinois sources, you may not have an Illinois filing requirement, but you should still look on their website to be sure of that. Uh, Non-resident aliens can be considered residents of Illinois, so you'll only complete the Schedule NR if you worked or lived in another state while in the U.S. Now, if you had no income received in 2018, but you're a non-resident alien, if you were physically present in the U.S. on an F or J visa in 2018, but you have no income, you still have a filing requirement, you must fill out that form 8843. Remember a few slides back, we said all non-residents have to complete this form. Dependents who hold an F or J visa must also submit um, the 8843, which means you must submit it on their behalf. Um, U.S. born children who are residents for tax do not need to submit this form to the IRS. This is just a statement that says that you are physically present in the U.S. as an F or J visa holder. Uh, this form has a different deadline than the IRS filing deadline. It's June 15, 2019, and Sprintex will create this form for you automatically. Quick knowledge check for federal and state tax filing. The name of the software provided for non-resident tax filing is Sprintax. Software is a free resource. It will calculate the substantial presence test and federal and state tax returns for non-residents for tax. If you do use it to create your state tax return, there is a small fee for processing. All right. Section six, additional information and getting assistance. We're going to talk about prior year filings and corrections, free resources, paid resources, and a checklist for the future. Prior year filings and corrections. 
If you failed to report self-reported income, for example, or if you made another error in tax filing for a previous tax year, you can correct that by completing an amended tax return. Um, that form is called a 1040X, and for Illinois, it's an IL 1040X. You can also file a return if you forgot to file tax returns. Um, you would need to file an original return for that year. Additional information and getting assistance. Um, these are some free resources that are, are available to University of Chicago students uh, that are outside of the University of Chicago. So IRS free file tax assistance software, we've provided a link for you. You can also go to in person or call the IRS local office or the Illinois State Revenue Office if you have specific questions. Um, this is the busiest time of year for them, so I do want to caution you that going in person, you may be waiting quite a while to speak with anyone. So if you do call, just make sure that you have a little bit of time available to wait on hold as well, but it may be a better option than going down there in person. Also, these VITA or VITA volunteers, these are individuals who are, for example, former accountants who are certified to assist individuals um, in filing tax return and tax returns and provide that information for free now, but it's generally for those who have an adjusted gross income of $55,000 or less. I would highly recommend using the online locator that we've linked here, going to the, uh, or calling them at their 1-800 number, which we've listed here. Um, they can let you know, A, if you qualify for assistance with them, and B, where their nearest location may be and what their hours are. Um, there are 10 sites within a 10-mile radius of us, including Harold Washington Library and Robert Morris College. Um, a lot of them are accessible by CTA, so by bus or train. Some paid resources that are available. Um, you can always go to a certified public accountant or an enrolled agent. These are individuals who are certified to help taxpayers file tax returns. Um, we've provided links to those professional organizations here so you can locate a person that is licensed to help you. There are also some national tax prep chains like H&R Block and Jackson Hewitt. Those work best typically for simple, straightforward returns. If you don't own property, if you don't have a lot of foreign or domestic um, investment accounts, things of that nature. You can also purchase some online software like TurboTax. Um, there are free versions of these online software um, packages, but most of the time you will have to pay a nominal fee in order to file your tax return. If you do choose to use a professional tax preparer, make sure of a few things. You want to make sure that they've done student and non-resident tax returns in the past. You want to make sure that they have passed state and federal certifying exams. They should be able to provide copies of those certifications to you. You want to make sure that they're going to give you an estimated price for services up front, including all fees. You absolutely want to avoid individuals who will not give you a price quote up front but will tell you that they will only charge you a portion of the refund that you are going to receive so if they tell you that they will charge as their fee 10 percent of what your tax refund is um, that is a predatory practice and you do not want to hire that person you also want to hire someone that provides what is called audit assistance what that means is that if the IRS has questions about the tax return that that they have filed on your behalf that person will help you and answer all the IRS questions um, on your behalf so you won't be stuck doing that on your own. For the future, so for 2019 and beyond, you want to make sure that you're keeping a file with all of your scholarship payments and that you're trying to categorize them into types of payments as you receive them receive them. So you want to talk about the differences between stipends, fellowships, and wages throughout the year to save yourself time when it comes to tax filing. Also, you want to keep receipts for possible educational expense deductions. You want to make sure that you're making estimated tax payments. So visit that university website that provides more information about estimated tax payments and ask questions throughout the year if you have them rather than waiting until the very end. You can visit taxes.uchicago.edu for more information about all of these things. But again, I want to direct you to gradhelp at uchicago.edu for more general follow-up questions um, in addition to the information that we've covered in this presentation. Thank you for joining us. We hope you have a lovely day.